Good afternoon and thank you for joining. This is Michelle Savage with XBRLUS and you are here for our webinar on machine readable data through the XBRL standard. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to just uh, cover a few logistical points. As we go through the presentation, feel free to submit questions by clicking on the Q&A link that you see at the top of your screen and uh, we'll follow up on those questions when we get towards the end of the session. Um, also, if anyone has any kind of technical difficulties uh, with accessing the event, please email us at support, S-U-P-P-O-R-T, at xbrl.us, and we'll do our best to get you back up and online. Well, with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce you to our speakers today. Uh, we have with us uh, Jarrett Lakota. Jarrett is with uh, Ernst & Young in Global Assurance Standards Methodology and Implementation Resident in their global professional practice. We also have Mark Montoya. Mark is Senior Business Analyst at the FDIC. And, uh, and then finally, we have Scott Tice. Scott is President and CEO of NovaWorks, and Scott is also Chair of the XBRL US Domain Steering Committee. So for our agenda today, we're first going to talk briefly about the Expert US Taxonomy Development Handbook. This is a comprehensive guide that was created by the Domain Steering Committee that, uh, as I mentioned, Scott Tice leads that group. And so he's going to tell us a little bit about the guide, which was really designed as a, kind of a toolkit for regulators to help those regulators that are interested in adopting the Expert standard for uh, regulatory data collection. The next we're gonna go into um, a part of the taxonomy development handbook. And that's really what this series is all about is outlining what's in the handbook and how it can help regulators. And we're gonna be covering the taxonomy as the basis for standards and automation. And Jarek Lakota from Ernst & Young, who's actually been involved in XBRL for many, many years is um, gonna be covering that. And then finally, we're gonna to go to a regulator interview where Jarrett is gonna talk with uh, Mark Montoya Mark was really instrumental in putting the FDIC program in place. And uh, they're gonna have a little bit of a conversation about uh, what the FDIC has done and um, how they're able to leverage standards today. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to uh, Scott Tice, who is gonna tell us a little bit more about the Taxonomy Development Handbook. Scott? Thank you, Michelle. I'd like to start off with basically who we are and what we do. Um, we have been involved with EDGAR and XBRL uh, since its inception, and we're one of the leading developers of XBRL tools for filers, filing agents, and whatnot to be able to uh, collect up data and do that last mile of tagging and submitting things to the SEC. Uh, a number of years ago, is my, with my activity with XBRL US, uh, I was asked to if I would share the uh, DSC, and also with the primary goal of developing, at the time we called it a development guide, but a taxonomy development handbook. And that was number one was to get a single source place with easy to read information on how to put, how to, how to develop things with XBRL, how to use XBRL as part of a project. Um, with XBRL, there's a lot of information that's been available over the past decade and a half but it's kind of scattered all over the place. And if you go look at the specifications and whatnot, they're pretty cryptic. And if you don't understand XML, if you don't understand uh, you know, basic, a lot of data stuff that has to do with XML and the way XML operates, you can get lost very quickly and they become, can become very daunting, which is rather unfortunate because when it comes to data standards and the ability to represent data and also represent it in the long term with meaningful information and com comparability and actually have information attached to the data points that uh, can mean something to three or four years from now or compare across various models, XBRL is the thing to use. And the idea of having a taxonomy really, uh, it really helps to take the semantic business model, extract out what you need and put it into terms that everybody can use, consumers, regulators, and uh, the people are actually preparing the data. So that primary goal here was to develop this basic in, uh, reference instrument, in essence, to guide people through the development. And I think we've achieved that. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Michelle. The uh, document is available, as you see here, at XBRL US sl uh, slash XBRL dash reference slash TDH. And that's an HTML form. We also have it in PDF form. 
one of the things we did with this wasn't just to explain XPRL in terms of facts and the dimensionality and how to build taxonomies. We actually have an example taxonomy going through the process of building it is we also provided um, documentation for things like a white paper, an XPRL overview, taxonomy guide, preparers guide, data consumer guide to give people who are in the development process in building a taxonomy uh, some of the tools I need to get started, basically a launching point. So you're not starting off with a blank sheet of paper going, oh, where do I start? So uh, that, and a lot of that was born from the number of taxonomies that XPRL US, US has been involved in developing over the years. And there's quite a few of them that are now uh, working very well. And uh, I, I think we have a lot of good information in here. And uh, I would recommend you go ahead and take a look at it because um, that's again, what we're gonna be talking about today in here we have, it's about 200 some odd pages, a, a single point that you can use that references the actual specifications and the, a lot of the information on XPRL International and XPRL US. So there's a solid foundation of standards that help support you being able to develop proper taxonomies. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Jarrett and he's gonna talk about the standard and, and taxonomies and uh, cover what this all really means and how it comes into play. So go ahead, Jared. Thanks, Scott. Um, first, uh, just going to briefly discuss high level what XPRL is. So XPRL is an open, non-proprietary data standard designed for financial data, but able to accommodate any other type of data as well. Because it's so widely used around the world, it is a standard of how business and government data is prepared, collected, and extracted, and analyzed. Um, it's supported by a robust community that continuously expands and evolves upon the technical XPRL specification. Um, a key thing to note is because it's a standard, costs for those reporting, collecting, and using the data tend to remain low. And in addition to being inexpensive, it's easier for governments who adopted the standard to change reporting requirements and adapt to new technologies that may come along. Um, so this, this webinar will try to explain why the taxonomy is the most important part of building effective standards. Um, next slide, please. Um, the next few slides will cover some common data collection scenarios. Um, there are over 400 US government agencies collecting data from thousands of entities across the country, including state and local governments, other agencies, public companies, and private companies. That data is submitted as PDF files, through online forms, spreadsheets, and in some cases, custom-built schemas um, in formatting languages like XML, JSON, HTML, or CVS files. Some, but not most of the data in the US is submitted in XPRL uh, format through lots of different commercial or even open source data preparation tools. Um, data received is sometimes available to end users by regulators, sometimes as the original submitted file, sometimes as machine readable data, either through custom built analytic tools or as originally submitted XPRL files like the SEC and the FDIC do today. Um, both of these latter two options provide fully automatable machine readable data. Um, data consumers extract and use whatever type of data the regulatory, the regulator makes available, in some cases copying and pasting or even retyping the data in the original submitted files. Um, next slide, please. Um, these scenarios have different implications for reporting entities, regulators who collect the data and data users. Um, in the first scenario, PDF files are easy for regulators to, to put in place. They just provide instructions to reporting entities on what to include in the report. The negative is that PDF files are electronic documents, not machine readable data, requiring data users to manually rekey information, which can cause delays, potential for errors, and the likelihood that users, including regulators, regulators, must make decisions based on old data or less robust analysis. Um, online forms shown in scenario two can be used to require reporting entities to rekey data into a web, web interface. This results in machine readable data, which is more timely and can be more accurate than the data collected in scenario one. The down the downside, however, is that regulators have to build online forms and filling online forms is labor intensive for reporting entities. It's also expensive for regulators to make changes to the reporting requirements. Now moving to scenario three, regulators can create custom schemas based on XML, JSON, or some other format. 
this can be done in such a way to generate machine readable data, but building a custom schema is just rec recreating what is already available in XBRL. As it requires data users to build custom tools to extract the data. Again, it's expensive to change the reporting needs because it requires a change in the custom schema, the data collection system, and for data users, a change in their extraction tools. With the XBRL standard, there are all the benefits of a custom schema without the need to create a custom schema or to build custom extraction tools. When reporting requirements change, it's easy to adopt them. The downside is that you need to take some time to build the data standards, although this process is easier than with option three because the structure is already there with the XBRL standard. Uh, next slide. In the next section, we're going to cover how this works. Um, slide 10, please. Um, we're start, we first start off by noting that XBRL is self-describing, which means that nothing beyond the XBRL report and the taxonomy used to create it is necessary for receiving systems to understand and interpret the data received. The taxonomy represents the collection of line items that can be reported, and the XBRL report contains the facts that are reported for a sp specific situation or an, as we call it an instance. Um, this is just like the statement of net position that we have um, being shown. Next slide, please. Now, now we're going to discuss what a taxonomy is, taxonomy is and why it's so useful. The taxonomy collection is a collection or a dictionary of terms that we call concepts that represent data that may need to be reported. Every concept in the taxonomy has a human readable and a machine readable label, a definition, and other associated characteristics that are baked into that concept. These characteristics are important because they help make the data when it's reported to be fully understandable and unambiguous. In addition to the collection of terms, the taxonomy also contains a structure that explains the relationship between those concepts. So this, will, this includes a presentation, which is a human readable hierarchy. Um, this presentation defines the hierarchical structures or concepts and allows the taxonomy to be organized and permits XBRL to be viewed in a software by humans and create a visual representation of the taxonomy um, that's easy to navigate. Preparers using the taxonomy can view the hierarchy of concepts. This is what creates what we call a visual tree depiction of the presentation of the hierarchy of concepts. Another relationship is calculations. The calculations define mathematical relationships. This allows values appearing in the XBRL to be checked for consistency by XBRL software. And this way a calculation provides those basic validation rules for instance documents creating, uh, created using the taxonomy. Um, like the presentation link, uh, presentation, the calculation are hierarchical as well, which kind of shows basically a parent and then all the children that sum to that parent level. Um, there's also something in the relationship known as definitions. I'm not going to go into great detail about that, but the definitions provide another way to define relationships between the context, uh, between the concepts. For example, um, maybe to indicate one concept is a specialized version of another concept or require the use of one concept should you uh, use another concept. Um, also, there's refer references, which add a different additional information. Um, an example is the US GAAP taxonomy um, for each tag um, has the applicable FASB standard codification that, that's related to it. Um, and then there's also various label relationships. And these various labels um, are associated to the human readable text, and it's also machine readable concepts as well. Um, the concepts contained in the taxonomy can cover all types of data, such as monetary, integer, percentages, strings or text blocks, volume, energy, and so on. Um, XBRL is also able to tell the user of the data what the data type is so that the machine receiving the data knows that it's getting a fact that's a measure of energy or a monetary value or represents a measure of area or, or volume. The importance of it is that it removes the ambiguity in of what the data represents, which then reduces the need for the human to interpret it. Next slide, please. Um, the XBRL report also called the, oh, go ahead. 
I apologize for interrupting. Um, we did get a question, and I thought this might be a, a good question actually for our our uh, software uh, software lead here, uh, Scott Tice. The question is just, what is the schema? You know, you talked about uh, about the schema, and Scott, would you want to address that? Sure, I can just take two seconds. Uh, basically, in a general sense, a schema is <clears throat> the definition of how data is structured, what data points are, what points to what. So a database can have a schema, you know, just a simple set of addresses and names and telephone numbers, for example. Or you could have a very complex schema. Uh, within XML, a schema actually defines the relationship between all of the different elements or concepts that you've created. So if you think of something like um, zip code or address that might be then under an entire address or postal address or shipping address. So it define those relationships in XML schemas are, are very rigid and what happens with XPRLs, those things are actually automatically defined when you build a taxonomy. Thanks, Scott. Sorry, sorry for interrupting there, Jared. <laughs> oh, oh, no problem. Uh, feel free. Uh, like I said, I just, I just heard, heard your voice. So I just figured I'd ask. Um, so going on, um, now that we've talked about the taxonomy, the actual extra bureau report, which is known as the instance document, represents um, sp a specific reporting situation. For example, let's say Microsoft's quarterly financial report for you know, June 30th, 2019, or a single audit report dated June 30th, 2020 uh, for the state of Hawaii. Um, the XBureau report serves as a transmission or storage vehicle for the data reported. The XBureau report contains all the facts that might be in the financial statement or other kind of report, plus additional information about those facts. Um, some of that additional information includes like units. Um, so let's say you have a monetary item type. Um, this instance document is going to contain a, uh, what's called a unit type, um, which will tell you, is it in US dollars, is it in euros, or some other currency. Um, it also has details, something called a decimal. So that can tell you what the rounding of the amount is um, for that. Um, it'll also contain some document specific information such as the time period of the report. And then also the reporting entity that's di disclosing that particular amount um, in the detail. Again, it's just removing this ambiguity about the data. Um, each reporting concept is unique and uh, prepared in, by the reporting entity but every X Bureau report relies on the taxonomy for instructions on what needs to be reported. Uh, moving on. Um, the taxonomy drives the data requirements so that the reporting entities, data collectors, and data users all speak the same language. Simply put, it dictates how the data in that report should be organized. The concept and structure in the taxonomy are referenced by various commercial data preparation tools in the market. Whenever a preparer needs to create a financial statement or other report, they open up their reporting tool, which then connects to the taxonomy to tell the preparer what he or she needs to report. The taxonomy also drives what is collected by the regulator in the data collection system. And it also referenced in various commercial applications used by the data consumers when they extract and analyze data. Um, the taxonomy is open and non-proprietary, so it can be freely used and as a reference point by all the tools. Um, next slide. The taxonomy gives the data collector greater control. So the data collector can make changes in the taxonomy once, once and those changes flow through the preparation tools, the data collection system, and the extraction and analysis tools. When reporting requirements change, those changes can be made by the business leads responsible for collecting the data. They don't need internal IT or some commercial software providers to make those changes to the systems or products. Um, next slide. Reporting entities and data users can use lots of different commercial and open source tools on the market because they all reference the same freely available taxonomy. The government entity manages the taxonomy and the data collection system. And then the commercial and open source providers manage the preparation and extraction tools based on this taxonomy, which then keeps the costs low for everybody. Next slide. Um, a single set of validation or business rules can be created by the data collector or regulator to check potential problems, such as you know, if there's mandatory concepts that need to be disclosed, um, if there's signage errors, um, there's conflicting concepts that just weren't meant to be you know, together. 
Um, it can check for reasonableness. Um, it can check for some mathematical errors or, or even scare, scaling errors. Um, those rules can be used in preparation tools, the data collection system, and extraction tools. Again, providing the same requirements and speaking the same language altogether by everyone. Um, moving on. Um, and now we're moving on to some how the taxonomy enables fully machine readable data. As we mentioned earlier, in addition to containing concepts to be reported, the taxonomy also provides information about how the concepts relate to each other. Um, next slide. Data is structured as a presentation so that you can see the hierarchy of terms, as I mentioned before. For example, this section in the US GAAP taxonomy shows the line items that fall underneath the current assets. The other relationships in the taxonomy come about through the creation of what's called table structures. The statement table shown here allows the preparer to identify facts that represent assets that may be previously reported or that are revisions from a prior period. Um, this is what we call a dimensional structure, and that allows a lot of flexibility in how the data is reported and is also effective in reducing the number of concepts that are needed in the taxonomy because they can be broken down in different ways. Um, next slide. Um, as mentioned before, the taxonomy also contains mathematical relationships. So in this case, these calculations and dimensional relationships provide a level of checking that can be used to improve the accuracy because it helps preparers understand how the facts should re be reported. So in this case, in the, under the calculation, you're showing all the children that, uh, that are on the top that all add down to the parent, um, which is for current assets. Next slide, please. Um, and each concept or line item has other properties. Um, so these properties are like data type can, pro can, can also be pr provided to provide data checks. For example, if you have a monetary item type, the reporting entity will be required to use a monetary fact or the ex bureau applications just won't validate correctly. Um, so kind of showing here on the screen um, where you have kind of a standard label um, that tag also has a standard definition. Um, and then we're showing the references. So in this case, it's showing the FASB codification because this is a US GAAP taxonomy concept. Um, and then some of the other properties, as we mentioned, show a data type um, of monetary. It has a period type, so it's instant. There could be instant or duration. Um, and then also um, a balance type is also, you know, if, if you have a debit or credit, in this case for a financial statement item. Um, next slide, please. Um, earlier, we talked about situations where regulators can build schemas, um, often in X, XML, or they could use some other format. Um, next slide. Um, as you can see on this slide, XBRL provides a structure that allows data to become machine readable. The XBRL structure is built on top of, this, of the technical format which could be XML, JSON, HTML, or even CSV, as we mentioned. Um, the XBRO International Best Practices Board has created XBRO versions that can be built on any of these platform uh, formats. Um, a format is effective at transporting the data, but by itself, with no additional structure added to it, a format cannot accurately convey the full meaning of the data. And that's where XBRO comes in. XBureau adds the consistent information layer that, we, that layer that we talked about earlier, and it adds what we call an identifier layer. Um, periodically, we see a regulator building custom XML schemas. Essentially, what they're doing is recreating what XBureau already has. And the problem with that is, besides the added work involved, is that the custom schema that they create will most likely be different from other custom schemas and from XBureau, so it's not a standard. So applications used to extract data from one custom schema will be different from applications extracting data from another custom schema too. And that adds the costs around the entire ecosystem. Next slide, please. Um, now that I've provided some insights on the power of XBR on the taxonomy, we're gonna transition to having a conversation with Mark Montoya of the FDIC in order to gain some insights on how XBR is used by the FDIC. Um, so as we discussed, Mark Montoya is a senior business analyst in the data strategy at the FDIC. 
Um, and he was one of the founders of the FDIC XBRO da Data Collection Program and has been involved in XBRO um, since 2001. So I'm, uh, hello, Mark, uh, thanks for joining us today. Are you there? I am here. Are we turning on our, our video? Yes. Yes, we are, so we don't scare everybody. Right? <laughs> so there we go, there I am. Hi, everybody, virtually. So, so Mark, uh, maybe now, before I start getting in some of the questions, maybe you can discuss some of the details around the FDIC's experience with adopting the XBRO standard. And then, and then, like I said, we can go through some of the prepared questions that we have, and then maybe take some questions from the viewer, uh, from the audience. Sure, sure, sounds good. So some of the experience, um, um, just with uh, applying X X XBRL at the, at, at the FDIC, one thing you gotta take in consideration uh, if you're gonna implement it within your, uh, within your agency is that um, the exercise of creating a taxonomy, you're gonna have to look at all your data, your data processes. And what I mean by that is you essentially have to look at your data from, from birth, what I call cradle, and to grave, right? Which is curation, right? So from the birth of creating an item that you want to start collecting uh, from whatever financial entity, you have to decide on uh, the, 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 the way you're gonna collect it and then how it's gonna be um, put into the taxonomy, how you're gonna actually send that out to be collected from the financial institution or, or entities to where it goes into your IT systems and back to your IT systems to where it gets stored into the database and then you do your analysis and all these reports and then you actually curate it throughout time, right? Um, and one big thing that you have to take into consideration is you need, and XBRL does this, right? Uh, with, the, with the standard, but you need a common data dictionary in order to get um, information from the collector use the same common data dictionary or common, dic common dictionary within your IT systems, within the business context too, where people can actually, from a business standpoint, understand what each other are talking about, all the way to the back end developers, to the back end systems. And then if you guys do data sharing, sharing with other, uh, other uh, regulators, having that common data dictionary is very important. Um, and just from our FDSC's efforts, it, uh, it took a lot. We, uh, throughout time, we swept all these data problems underneath the rug and said, ah, somebody else take care of them. But when you start going through creating a taxonomy and you start really looking at your data and you're and creating the attributes for it, you're going to start understanding, oh, yeah, we got to fix some of this data, data problems before you actually apply the taxonomy. Because if you have data problems when you start a taxonomy development, you're going to have the same data problems that are going to be replicated in your taxonomy when you actually go live with it. So you got to, it's, it's, it's a big, big thing from a, from a business process. You got to solve a lot of things also uh, before you start uh, design of the taxonomy. Thanks for that context, Mark. Yeah. Um, now we're going to kind of move to some other, uh, some of the prepared questions that we had um, that will probably be helpful for some of the audience um, based on the FDIC's experiences. So our first question that we have is, what can regulators learn through the process of building a taxonomy? Okay, I think I've, I've mentioned some of it already. Um, so, um, like like I mentioned, uh, with uh, ex from from experience with FDIC, while we uh, and we actually work from the Federal Financial Institution Examination Council, which consists of five regulatory agencies: the FDIC, the Federal Reserve Board, Office of Control of Currency, um, the CFPB, and also the NCUA. And working with these uh, various agencies, we had to uh, uh, come to an agreement. Again, going back to how we're going to actually share this information and what type of um, definitions are we going to use. And luckily, the Federal Reserve Board had something called the Microdata Reference Manual, which was a common set of terms that we shared, and we all agreed to use this going forward. So our taxonomy that we use uh, to collect uh, our financial reports from the financial institutions um, is based on this Microdata Reference Manual. And it has everything from total assets all the way to loans and leases, and these, there's this common data dictionary that we share has definitions for all the reports that we collect. So as we share this data dictionary and as we created our taxonomy, it actually allowed us to, to actually um, uh, create a better taxonomy because we did have it, a common set of definitions. And these definitions are shared from collection all the way through our backend systems and how we do analysis and how we do research that common identifiers found throughout all of our, all of our, um, all of our data systems. Um, but to, to, to let the, the, the uh, regulators know, you don't need to recreate the wheel. Other people have already done this. Um, don't follow our mistakes. Uh, you learn from, from the, the group and XBRL. Uh, the consortium's good at uh, actually helping everybody out. But the idea is get your house in order, 
and then start doing your development because anything that's going to be uh, if you have problems with your data before the taxonomy development, that's going to be replicated in the taxonomy. You just got to make sure that um, you get your house in order and, and start the process. If I can just add on to that, one of the things that we did in the taxonomy development handbook is we cover a lot of these issues as hard lessons learned over the last decade or so and, uh, and put a lot of information in with respect to stakeholders and data structure and things like that without becoming a tutorial on how to develop uh, database schema or database structure, but yet, you know, some of the pointers that, uh, that I think can help as you're developing, if you build a team to develop this and the kind of things you should look out for and, uh, and, the, and the kind of steps we think you should should engage in. And, and Scott, you bring up a, a good point. Um, there's, so we have a standard and, you know, you can apply a standard wrong incorrectly. Um, so having a method to how you apply the standard is very important. I think this, uh, the guide that uh, Scott has mentioned, it, it will be very helpful for anybody who wants to develop a taxonomy. Uh, applying the standard uh, uh, with a certain method you wanna follow going forward, that, that would help out a lot. Yeah. Wish we had that when we developed the taxonomy. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, about, uh, I think three of the chapters towards the end are, are solely devoted to you know, discussing project management, discussing how to to build the taxonomy, and then we actually go through and use a stupid widget example. It's just enough to get going with samples that work. Uh, and we all know in the real world, things are much more complicated. But uh, the whole point is to basically, you know, why not don't make other people's mistakes over and again and, and all, over again. And a lot of these things have nothing to do with XBR. They have to do with generally how you establish and build good data models that are both comprehensive uh, and extensible. And I guess on the third part, understandable by a wide range of people who need to model the data in ways that you might, have, might not have thought of. So, so, so getting into that, uh, you know, as you mentioned, you, you know, why did this single data model work for the FDIC? Um, so do you have some practical examples from, from that perspective? Yes, yes. Um, I like to call it maybe a, a common data model, but you know, every domain has a has has laws in the of the domain, right? And it's no different for uh, bank regulatory reporting. So that we have certain laws in this domain. So if you have laws in your domain, every, every domain has it. These these basic laws of the domain need to be explored, and those laws then need to be uh, integrated into a, a a system architecture. And that's what we did with this the single data model. We actually applied the rules within this taxonomy. And it's, it's a, again, goes back to a common set. You need to be able to be speaking the same language, not just the tech folks, but also the business folks. And this, this, this taxonomy we have has all the definitions uh, that the, the, the agencies uh, share. It's part of the call report. Um, and you know the call report taxonomy has these definitions and we send it out uh, to our software vendors um, and the software vendors incorporate that into their software. And then the banks, you know, they, they report the, the, uh, the call report every, every quarter. Um, what's interesting about it is it's defined, right? But I think we're going to get into it a little bit later. Uh, there's something very unique about our taxonomy and that's formless and, it, and that's how we do our data quality. Uh, and it's, it, it, it helps out a lot. But the idea of having a single model, uh, not, bare, not many, many models, um, but having a single model that everybody agrees on, uh, the banks, the, the agencies, and the software vendors is very important. You'll have much more data quality with a, with a good, good um, common uh, model. Thank you, that's helpful. So I guess kind of going into further details around that, um, why do you feel that the data received in a structure machine readable data format is better? And then maybe um, how is it different than other formats like PDF and you know what we mentioned, custom XML schema? Okay. Uh, having, uh, so the, uh, the call report, uh, just the physical, it's funny, the physical PDF file of the call report um, is, is a structured form. Uh, it's always been a, a structured form. Uh, it's interesting, the progression of it, we had a balance sheet income statement, and then obviously as, as, as banking laws and, uh, you know, again, the laws of the domain started getting uh, expanding, we started having subschedules and we started having a lot of, a lot of text and we created those text into uh, line item numbers. Um, so we have text line item numbers. Um, so it continued to grow. Um, but the idea of having a structured format and a structured taxonomy, uh, knowing what's gonna be collected for a certain item um, is, is a big deal. And we can actually, you actually can do better data analysis on what you know it's coming in throughout time. 
and you can do better time analysis. Uh, and everything that we have uh, is, is start and end dates, you know, quarter start, quarter end, year end, um, we all have start dates. That's very important for the attributes of collecting data and doing time series analysis. Um, and obviously it is different from PDF. You can't easily uh, analyze it. I guess there's tools out now that out there that can analyze it and convert it, but you can't easily uh, bring that information in. Um, and PDF files are considered unstructured data. So it just makes it makes it much harder. And the reason why we did not use a custom XML schema early on is because the XBRL standard had those definitions that we wanted in there already, like uh, non-negative monetary, uh, you know, you had credit debit, um, you had uh, instant duration. So we didn't want to recreate the wheel. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, and so another question is, in your experience, how did the standards affect the data quality itself? Um, okay, yeah, this, uh, this is great. So yeah, we do have a, a structure, ta structure taxonomy. And um, with the data quality, now the, our taxonomy has XBRL, base XBRL has the cal calculation link base that has everything sum up, uh, you know, and subtraction and stuff like that. But we made use of XBRL formulas. And with XBRL formulas, it allowed us to do a lot more different uh, things on the data that's coming in. Again, we have a taxonomy that's structured that can't be changed by the financial institution. We send out to software vendors. But at the software vendor level, we have these uh, levels of, uh, of formulas. Um, the first formula is a validation of um, valid, they call it validity validation or validity edits. And what happens is when the data fails at the bank level, uh, the bank can't submit the call report to, to our system at all. It just gets rejected at the software level. So it made the banks responsible for their data and they had to correct it before it can even be submitted up to us. That's the first level of validation. The second level of validation is called quality validation or quality edits. And in these quality edits, we can say we have certain amount of um, tolerances, right? The banks can uh, fail the tolerance, a uh, fail out, uh, you know, outside this tolerance, and they can put an edit explanation or a failure explanation in there and then send the report up so their analysts can review it and say yes or no if they agree to it. Um, now, the most important part of this taxonomy, there's something called reportability rules, and it's our way of creating scenarios on the data. So, uh, give you an example, there are base reportability rules, like a base rule that has just banks with domestic offices, or there's a second rule that's bank and uh, domestic and foreign offices. And then there's another one that's base, um, a consolidated uh, call report base scenario. So you have these base scenarios. And then from there, you start building additional uh, criteria on top of it. For example, a bank with just domestic offices, um, you have, okay, here's the bank with domestic offices. And then you ask additional questions of the bank. Uh, are you under 300 million? Have you, do we have any IBFs? Have you gone through any mergers? And based on that, it filters what the bank should report down to a subset. So instead of them reporting a full 3,000 items from the call report, it filters it down to the items that are, must be reported based on our criteria we give them. Again, going back to the, the, the laws of the domain that, we, that, that, we're, that we're defining. So we know what's coming in. Interesting. We, so it's, yeah. go ahead. I don't know. That's fine. I, I was just going to say that yeah. that's interesting that it, it, it it's not only a, you know, a way to transport data to you, but it seems like it's making their lives easier as well and increasing the quality at the same time. Exactly, and we consider that, we call that burden reduction because before the use of XBRL and use of formulas and reportability, the banks would have to submit everything in and they'll submit zeros or, or just leave them blank. So they'll have all this information coming in. Uh, and then after that, they, you know, now they're like, okay, we used to send this in the, in, 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 in before, XBRL, uh, how come we don't have to send it now? And we said, well, you never had to send it in before based on the reportability. So yeah, we That's automated good. that process. All right, it's helpful. Um, so our, our next topic is um, it, it, how, how did the FDIC leverage the standard infrastructure over time? So the beauty of XBRL, um, again, it continue, continues to evolve. It's not a, it's not a static um, uh, a specification. Um, when it first came out, they had just had the calculation link base and then they added formulas, which we used very heavily. But throughout time, so uh, the, the central data repository uh, system went out in, in 2005, went live in 2005. And then since then, we continued to add additional, uh, um, additional solutions based on the XBRL specification. Um, we released the Uniform Bank Performance Report, which is a peer group analysis of based on banks, uh, and we used uh, XBRL for that. 
Um, and then we moved on to using the dimensions, uh, XBRL specification uh, dimensions. And we used that to collect the, the, bank, the, the bank's uh, annual uh, summary deposit information, which has a lot of branch, de branch deposits in it. So we used the XBRL specific dimension specification for that. Uh, and then we did something unique. We actually uh, created, our IT division created a, like an enterprise hub. Uh, we call it an um, uh, enterprise uh, service-oriented architecture. So they created this hub and they're pulling information using web services directly from the central data repository. And what they do there, they, they offer a, the, a, an automatic pull of this information to our bank examiners. So when the banks uh, go, when the examiners go in to examine a bank, they used to have to wait, they pull down data from our old our mainframe and it would be up to 30 to 60 days old. Uh, and then after we implemented the CDR system and XBRL, they're able to pull it down in near real time. They'll pull it down and actually present the call report and the uniform bank performance report to the examiner at the bank using inline XBRL. And then um, going forward from there, um, you know, we're also looking at where XBRL is going to go in the future. And hopefully, you know, they have the, uh, uh, the version in link base. They have, uh, I think they're having... Um, additional uh, addendums to the specification. So they continue to, to move on. And we're hoping as they, as they move into additional areas that we'll be able to uh, use their specification and for, for, for further uh, um, solutions in the future. That's good to know that, you know, XBR, although it's, you know, obviously it's a standard and, and you have that infrastructure that it's also flexible and, and it can, you know, evolve over time to meet, to meet those needs. Um, so uh, very helpful. Um, so going on to our, our next question, um, can you provide some additional details around what happens when there's a change in your business rules or requirements? And maybe can you provide us an example of how you used X, the XBRL data collection system in handling that change? Oh yeah, yeah. So XBRL, again, I think I always say that it's 80% uh, it's, it's business change and, and, and you know 20% uh, technology change. So the XBRL taxonomy is part of a larger system. Uh, we have something called the Central Data Repository that you know we collect the information in, we do analysis, uh, we store it into a backend database, we have the extracts to other agencies. So a lot of, lot of parts to it. But the heart of this system is called the metadata management tool. And the metadata management tool is, um, if you understand the term of metadata and it being metadata driven, the idea here is that our call analysts actually make the changes to the system. And they can actually make changes to the system without any involvement from programmers or IT departments. So it's managed by, it was created by the business and actually managed by the business. So the metadata piece of it, when there's any new call report changes, call report changes has happened out, our call report updates uh, come from a report task force, which is outside the system. Uh, and they make decisions throughout the whole year. And um, when, when the changes come down, there's someone from the, uh, which we call the domain task force comes down and actually looks at the information and then gives it to our call analysts. And they, there's analysts that create the taxonomy presentation, they create the, um, they start working on the validation criteria, they start working on reportability rules, they start adding the, the data elements that need to be part of the taxonomy, all within this system. So there, there's a bunch of coordination between the Federal Reserve and FDIC of putting this information into the system anytime there's a change that happens. And once they make all these changes, again, coordination between the agencies, they say, okay, we're finished making changes. Let's publish it as draft and let the software vendors work on it and review it. So the software vendors do their little testing. We continue to test with it if there's any errors. And that's like a two week process of doing the, making sure the taxonomy is valid and ready, to, ready for you know, prime time, right? Um, and then after all the changes uh, and there's no more comments that there, there needs to be in the taxonomy, any updates, they go ahead and publish it out. So what's interesting part about this, um, we all, you know, we're all at home, we're all virtual right now. We wish we were in a room, but the pandemic happened, right? The COVID-19, I hope everybody's safe out there, but the pandemic happened, right? And what, you know, what, how we actually do call report changes, we plan it out for the whole year, right? We plan it out for all 2020, and then we break it up by quarters, March, June, September, and December. But, you know, the pandemic happened as we were getting ready for the March call cycle. Uh, and then uh, the, the CARES Act came out. And before the CARES Act, we were struggling, not struggling, but we were trying to implement uh, the, the CECL, you know, current expected credit loss. Now that's a, that's a bear to implement, um, but it, our system can handle it, right? 
So with the CARES Act, when it came out and we had to deal with uh, CBLR, um, Community Bank uh, Leverage Ratio Rule, uh, something called the Money Market Mutual Fund Liquidity Facility, which is crazy, um, you know, it's a crazy acronym. All these changes coming out of the CARES Act, we had to actually implement that into the process that we're already working on. So the system was easily updated. All we needed was the, the definitions for, for these items. Uh, and we easily put it into the system and started creating validation criteria for it. Um, and as it, it didn't come in immediately, we still had, they were still working on it. They were trying to, you know, they're trying to still sign the bill. They're getting early uh, information from, uh, you know, the other uh, um, agencies of what, what's happening, what we're going to do in the in, in, for the March call. But since the system was metadata driven, we can easily update it. There's times in the past where we were ready to go with the taxonomy, but you know, we're still getting OMB approval. We still have to go through OMB approval with the PDF files, right? It has an OMB number on the call report. Um, but that's just the nature of the system. And again, as, as I said, the taxonomy is part of it, but the system that's around it actually um, is metadata driven and allows us to make changes on the fly. And the other part is that the formulas also make, make it easier for uh, the banks to implement these, these changes. Interesting. So that, that's actually a great example because I know especially with the CARES Act that, you know, there's a, it, it seemed like there's a lot of confusion, a lot of difficulties, and it seemed like XBRL uh, with the standards in place made it a lot easier for, for you to implement those changes. Can you imagine if you, if you didn't have that in, in place, I'm assuming that would have been a lot harder for you guys? Oh, it would, yeah, it would have been a lot harder. Yeah, definitely. So uh, a, go, go oh, go ahead. I had a question with respect to uh, the change in format. I understand that you had mentioned at one point that originally you filed your the instance data that was submitted to you guys um, was done in straight XML, but it's done in IX bureau now. Is that the case or? So uh, early on, it was done in uh, EPSIDIC mainframe. Oh, program. wow. <laughs> wow. That goes back to my, my early time too. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's way back when, right? It was still on electronic format. It's just a different, different, uh, you know, different format at the time. But uh, no, to answer your question, uh, so before then, uh, be pulling the information, if you're talking about the examiners, it's called the examiner toolkit when they're out in, in the field, they would go to our old, it was a, uh, it was a mainframe solution. And what would happen from an old, old way of doing it, they would actually have developers in-house and they would write the software, look at the call changes, right? They're, they were acting just like the software vendors were acting before XBRL. They would look at the changes in the call report, look at them, look at the instructions and key in the, the code from PDF to the software, they would code it in. And a lot of times they would have errors in it. It wouldn't match up with you know, our rules. Um, the edits would be, or the validation criteria would be incorrect. And they would send it out to the, to the examiners and the examiners were using data that was old, that was 30 to, uh, six, uh, 30 to 60 days old, maybe 90 days old. But um, after with, with the central data repository and using web services, and we, we created this uh, in, in enterprise uh, service oriented architecture, when they're at the bank, they log in for you know VPN to uh, to our system, uh, to our network, pull in all their examination information, and then pull the data from uh, from uh, the central data repository, and it's presented back to the uh, um, to the software to the uh, to the examiner uh, in IXBRL. So there's there's templates, IXBRL templates that they view view the information back at the uh, at at the examination level. Yeah. So that means it, it looks like a human readable form, but it's a completely machine readable format. Mm -hmm. With all the intelligence in it. That's correct. Yep. Hey Mark, can I just jump in? We have a we have a few questions. And I'm sorry, Jared and Mark. Um, but one thing I wanted to one question that we had, which I think you you kind of answered, but is um, you know, can you provide more explanation as to why taxonomy changes don't require downstream IT changes? Because I think obviously that's a big issue for regulators. And you talked about how the taxonomy is managed by um, your internal bank analysts who are not IT people, and that then those those changes go out to the software providers, but those are all commercially available software applications, right? So it's like banks can use one of multiple different software packages. Maybe you could explain that a little bit further just to kind of get the, the idea of that there are lots of different software applications that are all talking to the taxonomy and that taxonomy is managed by your bank people, not by IT Sorry, that was kind of a long-winded question. And you're on you're on mute now, sorry. Yeah, there's a lot of questions in there, but uh, I think I, I can remember <laughs> those. So the first one, um, going back to the IT question, um, it's it's coming up with a common a common dictionary. 
um, all of our backend systems are based on this microdata reference manual. So all of our databases have uh, an identifier for total assets uh, and loans and leases, and it goes on from there. Everything is based, all the backend systems are based on this common identifier. Um, we also have, and just like in any other uh, regulatory agency, we have this common identifier. And then as you go deeper, deeper into the, you know, the nether world of the regulatory reporting, uh, uh, regulatory world of uh, their databases, right? Uh, kind of old school databases, they have their own identifiers at the lower level. But this common data dictionary um, is, is used throughout <clears throat> the, all the uh, Federal Reserve, uh, all the uh, federal regulatory agencies, the FFIC agencies systems. So we all speak the same language. So when they make they make a change to the taxonomy based on these, uh, these identifiers, um, the IT systems do not have to, you know, they don't have to write all this additional code. They pull it in. They do have to do obviously database updates and stuff, you know, it's a new database thing, deltas and all this other stuff. You have to do that, but they don't have to create uh, uh, additional systems to, uh, to to pull this information and they can, they can actually use this common data dictionary. Um, and then the second question was our business analyst, right? So um, just like our software vendors, uh, we it's, it's just an application. It's just a GUI interface to a database, right? So they're looking at, adding uh, the, uh, ex the, the taxonomy information into it, the pre like I said, the presentation, the, um, uh, the definitions, uh, the, the, the MDRM items that the common identifier. So they're adding all this stuff to the taxonomy. The only thing that they had that we had to train them on is how to write XBRL formulas. So the business people, and the reason they do this is, is because they understand the data, right? They understand what they want to collect using that again, um, uh, uh, at microdata reference manual ID. Um, and they write the formulas, you know, essentially it's if then else statements in the formula. So they had to, we had to train them to, to write XBRL formulas, even new people that are detailed to the, the call report cycle for a year, they have to learn how to write formulas, XBRL formulas. So they do need to do that. But it's uh, what, I, what I mean by metadata driven, they, they make all these systems, that, all these changes in a system, right? In you know, an interface. And when they're ready to publish a taxonomy, they essentially hit publish and it creates this you know, this common data model, as we said earlier on, uh, this taxonomy, sort of a template. They put everything in this template and it publishes this taxonomy out with the formulas and we send it off to the uh, software vendors. Now, from the software vendor standpoint, um, so they have this, com again, common uh, reporting model, common, common data model, and it goes out, there's like nine software vendors we have now. They all, all have various variant solutions, right? But as we send this uh, taxonomy out to them, they all are working off the common set of definitions that we uh, have set up for the call report. Um, and they provide all these different, you know, they're, they're software developers, right? Or software uh, vendors. They put all this fancy stuff on it. They all have different solutions. Some of them are desktop only, you know, client server or desktop, you know, you install it every quarter. Some of them tie into the back end GL systems. So they have to, you know, need more time to tie it into the back end GL systems. But the good thing about it is that they use the common model that we provided and they can actually write software and they can help the bank map to this, um, to this, to this model to submit it up to us. I think that's all the questions, right? Oh. I think so. Yes. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, another question that we got and, and Jared, do you want me to just go ahead and ask questions that have come in or? Jared, you're on mute actually. Oh, that, that, that actually makes sense. I apologize for that. Okay, that's okay. Because um, we have gotten a bunch of questions. Um, one question is please define XBRL versus inline XBRL. And I think that could be really for any of any of you guys. I, I mean, my, my simplified explanation is difference is, is basically, you know, inline XBRL from my basic understanding is it, it's embedded into the HTML itself. So it's kind of behind the scenes. So you can actually see the HTML view, but the XBRL is located embedded into that into that file. Um, that, that, that's my simplistic um, explanation. I don't know if uh, Scott or Mark have yeah, a I'll, more technical or, or better explanation. Yeah, I can jump into that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> the early idea behind what, you know, it's referred to as the instance, and that's some of the terminology that's carried around programmatically. You know, that's essentially your report. And in that, and we talk about this in the TDH, you represent your data as facts. And uh, those facts are going to be either machine readable or human readable. In a machine readable sense, it's gonna be very consistent if I have a number, what its precision is, it'll always have the right number of zeros in terms of scaling and things like that. Human readable, I might say, oh, in this table, it's in millions or it's in thousands. 
Um, and there's lots of different kinds of facts and a lot of different debt dimensionality. All this information is carried in the instance with the original XBRL that was coded in as XML. So it was difficult to read without a tool to actually read it. The idea behind inline XBRL, which has been around for a while now, is that HTML actually allows you to embed additional information that the browsers will just simply ignore. So by putting the fact information around the data that's in the report in an English or in a, in a visual sense, a human readable sense, you're allowing you to have a combination of human readable and the machine readable portion and still have the same exactness. The only difference between that and the regular XML in terms of the actual facts is we have this thing called transformations. Uh, for example, if I say something's in millions and I have you know, one, two, three, four in XBRL XML, that'll be one, two, three, four, zero, 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 zero. In IXBRL, let's say that it has a scale or a precision of millions and you'll have a transformation that'll take the commas out or in a European sense might take the decimals out because they do a different format. So inline XBRL gives you that flexibility to do that. So you don't have to actually worry about previewing it and still get all that benefit. Uh, in addition, there's other things that have been brought about like JSON, which is part of JavaScript object notation. And not to get too detailed, but that's kind of become the standard du jour for moving a lot of data around today. So you can represent your instance data as a JSON file. You still have a taxonomy and you still have all this other information, uh, but you can use that for other systems. Uh, and uh, finally, the, the comma delimited format or CSV comma separated format is really, it's very simple, but it's extremely useful for representing large amounts of data that are tagged the same way over and over again. So you don't have a lot of tagging overhead. So that's where that's found a lot of use. So all four of those methods can be used and employed. And depending on what type of implementation you have, you can pick or mix what you'd like. And what you'll see like at the SEC now takes inline XBRL, but they'll still produce an XML instance. So if you have a consumer who doesn't know how to read inline XBRL, they can use the XML instance because it actually doesn't, it's, it's a fairly trivial task to fish that data out of there and turn it into the appropriate format. So I hope that answered the question then. All right, some other questions we have that I wanna make sure we get to, and I know we're getting close to our, our time here is, um, is there a way, uh, uh, one individual asked, Mark mentioned the dictionary. Can the public have access to the FDIC dictionary of terms? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, you can. So just everybody on the phone, all you gotta do is go to, you can go to Google or go to Bing or go to Brave, whatever browser you like, and do a search for MDRM Federal Reserve Board or MDRM FRB, and it will come right up. So it's the Micro Data Reference Manual Federal Reserve and it, the, the website will come right up and you can go in there and you can read the background on it and go into it. And it'll give you more uh, detail on, on, on how, to, how it's set up and how to use it. Um, and just to give you a quick, you know, some quick information about it, there's an, there's an item, item number, it's, it's a number, 2170 is total assets across all reports. Call report, bank holding company report, foreign report, all these reports. So 2170 represents total assets. Only when you add a mnemonic on top of it, where like Archon 2170 becomes consolidated assets or bank holding company 2170 becomes bank holding company total assets. And that's how the data dictionary works. So if you look at our instance document, it's just a name value pair. It's 21 Archon uh, 2170 and it's got the value and it's you know, got the end tag on, on the instance. And that's, what, that's what comes in uh, from the banks to, to uh, FDIC, right? And any explanations on what the data failed. Um, and, and, and that's it, that, the, the, that dictionary is, is key to going forward. Um, and I would suggest, I don't know, maybe you guys can use that or, or create your own, but you need to have a common data dictionary in order to talk from a tech standpoint and from a business standpoint. You need to be able to explain and prove what the data means. And I think this common data dictionary starts, starts with that. Great, thanks Mark. Um, another question we got is <clears throat> some detractors, and this is again, a question for, for anybody here. Some detractor, detractors might suggest that the SEC's Edgar system and or the US GAAP taxonomy didn't accomplish what it set out to do in achieving consistency that aids in analysis. For instance, you know, the Microsoft quarterly instance may not be apples to apples comparison to other companies' quarterly instances. Um, what 
you know, what are the counter arguments to this and, and what lessons learned can we use about the US GAAP taxonomy and the SEC implementation that can be applied to other taxonomies? That, that's a very large question. Nobody wants to take that. Uh, I'll, I'll <laughs> take it because I'm on the kind of on the outside of it. I think when the SEC developed the GAAP taxonomy, the first ones, first they were done by the regulation SX and split up into the different article companies. And that changed during the implementation of the pilot program. Um, you're looking at an exceptionally complicated, and I think people thought it was a well understood data model, but it really wasn't. Uh, every registrant had a little bit different way of uh, thinking about the gap codification. And then the gap codification wasn't really a one to one representation between that and the concepts or elements that were defined as part of the taxonomy. And to give you an idea, though, of the complexity of this, I think the current uh, 2020 taxonomy has something like 18,000 elements in it. And there's a lot of different ways to dimensionalize data and to represent data. And there wasn't a lot of guidance provided with respect to how to do that. And as a consequence, being a bleeding edge new technology, having very complicated data sets, uh, having a lot of trouble with validation, having a lot of filers feeling like, well, this is a, you know, it's a burden and people aren't using it, which is definitely not the case. It's being used all over the place now. Uh, you had a lot of trouble at the very beginning, but I think with the data quality committee and now that FASB has been running the taxonomy for quite a long time, uh, the, the situation has improved dramatically and uh, the, the data is quite useful. I think if, if you turned around today and said, let's not do XBRL for SEC filings, you'd have a a world of people screaming about it. So uh, yeah, I think there, there was a lot of growing pains with it, but I think it was it was well worth it in the long run. Jared, I don't know if you wanted to add to that or- I, I mean, I, I, I would definitely say in my experience from the beginning, I, I would say to, to this, you know, to mention what Scott said is, you know, there were, there were different ways of tagging things in the beginning. Um, now that the taxonomy has evolved and it's uh, matured, um, I think the FASB has done a very good job of going through and taking out the, those many differences and making it, I'd say, more standardized or structured so that you, you can't tag that same item, you know, two or three different ways. Um, that doesn't mean that, it, you know, that there aren't a, a couple areas that you could, but for the most part, um, I think they, they've kind of looked at those and said, okay, What's the best way of tagging this information? Um, also, I would say, you know, outside of, you know, definitely the face financial statements. Um, if you look at the quality from that, that has increased dramatically over time. And I'd say, you know, with the fact that those are just line item tags, um, I, I'd say the face are definitely, you know, comparable to, to the other companies. When you start getting into dimensions, as Scott mentioned, with like the notes, um, that's where it can be more complex. Um, but I have to say from, you know, year one to now, it, I, I would say the quality is substantially better than, than it was before. And, and therefore, you know, it's being used a lot more because of it. So, Michelle, I, 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 I add, add to this. I, I think, you know, they, implementing the taxonomy is hard. And there's two different models that, you know, FDSC chose one and SCC chose, chose one too. And we all learn from, from what we've done. And I think the, the, the next thing is, you know, we, we have this, they have these systems. Where do we go from here? How, how do we go into the future and use the, the new technology, new tools that are out there? XBRL could be used with additional technologies too, just to expand it. Um, the CD, Central Data Repository is going through a, a modernization, I think in the next year, year or two. They're looking at how to use uh, distribute, you know, DLT, distributed ledger technology, how to do algorithmic regulation. We're looking at all this, uh, you know, this, all these additional technologies that can help get us to the next level. Um, and then, you know, maybe uh, SEC will go through a modernization too, and they're, and they're, and maybe they're working on. It. We, we just don't know, but work on the modernization aspect of it, uh, the FASB and SEC, and just, you know, we'll go into the future with our eyes wide open and ready to to to, to make a big difference. It's just it's just the nature of what we're doing with with, with technology. Um, yeah, I think we just add on to that. An important part of doing any project is to understand the stakeholders and the data model. And uh, 
if you look at a lot of systems and Michelle's been involved in some of these taxonomies that have been developed for other applications where they've had a fairly narrow model, you might start off with, with forms or existing information that was pretty rigid. And uh, one thing you can say about SEC data with GAP, it's not rigid. I mean, it's rigid in the sense that if you go to regulation SX as to what you have to disclose and the type of information you have to disclose, but not necessarily uh, every detail of how it's disclosed. And of course, as we all know, the devil's in the details. And that's why you get so much variation. And you can rotate the axes on tables. You can put something in five different tables by time or by region or by whatever. And all of that stuff caused a lot of complication. And again, that was on the bleeding edge where we're not anymore. So and that was a big concern in terms of what we were doing with the TDH because we want to tell a story that this does stuff that no other format can really do. And uh, um, so I, I think if you look at Mark's situation, they went through a lot of stuff and have had a lot of good expandability. And I think the SEC, if, if you ask them now, you'd see this being a success. Um, but uh, yeah, going back to the detractors, there's, you know, there's always people who are gonna you know, be naysayers on it, but uh, we keep pushing forward because we think this is the way to go. And so do a lot of other people. And, and I think there, there are also certain decisions that are made when first building a taxonomy and looking at the data that needs to be reported. And the taxonomy development handbook does go through some of these like a kind of a checklist of what do you need to think about and one of the big decisions um as scott mentioned is you know related to the us gap taxonomy is that it's so the the accounting standard itself is so flexible that extensions had to be allowed and extensions are the big the big issue i think with the us gap taxonomy and also at the time that the taxonomy initially came out there wasn't a lot of kind of anchoring of a new newly added element to a higher level element and we're seeing a lot more of that now. So, um, it, you know, I, I think the fact that extensions were allowed and in many taxonomies they're not allowed, and also the fact that there wasn't a lot of anchoring, which is a more common practice today, um, it is what resulted in some of the, the challenges with the data initially. I know we're running over, uh, but I have one real quick question for you, Mark. Are you an open taxonomy or closed taxonomy? I mean, is it rigid? Uh, we are a closed taxonomy, yeah. so no, the banks cannot extend it. Uh, that's why our validation works works very well um, because it, they can't extend it. We know what we want, and the banks know what we want, and they can't extend anything. If they try to extend it, it just gets rejected at the software level. Yeah, we talk about that too in the TDH and how mm -hmm. you can approach that. And there's a lot of different ways to define what is open and what is closed. You know, so. So, so I think I, as Scott pointed out, we're we're kind of running over our time here, um, but. There are a few questions that we may need to go back and answer, and I will definitely take a look at them and, and see what we can respond to. Um, and, and we appreciate everybody's feedback and input on the, the questions. Um, you know, I want to thank, you know, Jarrett and Mark and Scott for really presenting a, giving a great presentation on not only, you know, how do taxonomies work and how does XBRL work, but also how does it really apply in reality in, a, in the FDIC case study. Um, I want to mention that this is this is part of a series, so we are going to have another session in um, in October, and it's going to be on how XPBRL uh, represents data. So that will be a continuation of of the taxonomy development handbook. What's in there, but just kind of fleshing out a little bit more and giving uh, giving a little a little bit more um, information about it, rather than requiring everybody to just sit and read the document. But again, we do encourage you to go read the document because there's a lot in it. And, um, um, you know, and if you have questions, please get in touch with us. And we hope to see you in our, our next webinar. Okay, so thanks very thanks. much. Good job, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Jarrett. Thanks, Scott. Thanks. And thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us today.